Full moon, check. City light pollution, check. Super small telescope, check. We have all the exact wrong conditions to capture a galaxy, so let's see what we can do. Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Nico Carver. I am an amateur astrophotographer and I like to make videos like this one to help beginners who are interested in astrophotography get started with some tips and tutorials. If you're new to this channel, please subscribe by pressing the red button right below this video. And for those returning, I'll just mention briefly here that I do have a Patreon that starts at just $1 a month. And I truly appreciate the support. It really helps me make these videos. Today, I'm going to show you every step of capturing a galaxy with your DSLR or mirrorless camera. And as the intro suggested, I'm gonna do it with some difficult starting conditions. Normally for capturing a galaxy, you want a large telescope with plenty of focal length to resolve detail, because galaxies are pretty small um, from here on Earth in terms of their size in the sky. Um, and you want to shoot normally on a moonless night from a dark site to improve the, you know, the contrast of the image because uh, due to atmosphere and light pollution, we're always trying to improve that contrast uh, of the deep sky object. Well, we're doing the opposite of all those things, not just to be contrary, but for sort of two reasons. Um, one, I find it fun to test the limits of my equipment and processing skills. Um, and, I, and I also hope that, uh, you get something out of it by seeing sort of uh, how to process images when when we're we're starting with conditions that are not so great. Um, how how can we how can we subtract really heavy light pollution gradients and deal with the noise of of heavy light pollution um, and with a small telescope? And number two, I hope that this um, inspires people to try shooting galaxies with whatever gear they have. You know, you don't have to feel like you need to get the perfect scope and mount, um, you know, even with just a zoom lens on a simple star tracker, you should try this. I think that you really might be shocked at what you can do. I was definitely surprised by uh, results I've gotten with small telescopes. And uh, lastly, uh, for an intro here, this video is part of my start to finish series. Um, it's something I'm trying out. And what that means is it'll be a pretty long video because I'm gonna show you every step of the process. We're gonna start here in the house and I'll explain the equipment that I'm gonna use. And a few of the ins and outs and considerations when uh, thinking about what equipment to buy and things like that, and uh, what different pieces of equipment do, what they're good for. And I also just want to note here, it's a really good idea to sort of take stock of your equipment and make sure you understand how it all works indoors. And you, you do that so that you really get to know your equipment before you bring it out into the dark because everything gets so much harder outside in the dark. After we look at the equipment, I'll show setting it up outside, which includes uh, just putting it all together, focusing the telescope um, on a bright star, finding the galaxy. The galaxy is going to be invisible um, to us and the camera because uh, of the light pollution, but, but we'll use a, a technique called star hopping to find it. And then we'll start capture, capturing our lights. And if you're new to astrophotography and you hear that term capturing our lights or light frames, that just means our actual photos of the night sky. And with deep sky astrophotography, we take hundreds of the same spot in the night sky. And the point of this is because when we get to the processing stage, which I'm gonna show in this video, we're gonna stack them all together in software. And by stacking them all together, you know, uh, let's say 500 30 second exposures, that turns into one super exposure. So about five hours of total time. And by combining all those short exposures together, what we're doing is, through stacking is we're reducing the noise in the picture. And by reducing the noise, that's what will make the galaxy all of a sudden stand out. So in a single light, you know, we're not gonna be able to see the galaxy. It will be invisible to us because of that light pollution. But after we stack them all together and subtract the light pollution, 
the Galaxy will stand out uh, uh, because we've reduced the noise and done some other processing. Um, in addition to lights, and re remember lights just means your photos of the night sky, I'll also show taking calibration frames. And those are called darks, flats, and bias frames. And I'll explain later what each of those terms means. Once we have all of those pictures, and astrophotographers will often call all of our pictures as one big thing, our data. So all of the pictures put together is our data, and we compile it all, we compress it down into one single picture, but uh, one single astrophotograph is actually made up of hundreds and hundreds of lights, darks, bias, and flats. And we're going to take a look at each of those types of pictures, the, the lights, meaning the actual photos of the night sky, and the three calibration frames in their raw state. So you can see what they look like, and we'll talk about what they do. Then we'll move on to processing those pictures. And there's sort of two stages in processing. There's the pre-processing, which is the calibration registration, which means taking all your pictures and matching them up based on the star patterns so they're all exactly aligned. And then stacking, which again is, is, is taking tons of, of exposures and, and making them down into one um, and reducing the noise by throwing out outliers like hot pixels and things like that. Um, after we're done with that pre-processing, which in this video we're going to use Deep Sky Stacker, which is a free Windows program, we'll move on to Photoshop. And Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, is a really popular program for post-processing of all kinds of photography, including astrophotography. I'll have some other videos, though, below this one. They might not be available right away, but within a week or two. Um, that show the other programs uh, that you could do this with. So if you're interested in, in a different program, not Photoshop or Deep Sky Stacker, uh, watch the first half of this video and then move on to one of those other uh, videos. And um, I'll have one video that shows the whole thing in PixInsight, just a paid, uh, more advanced program. I'll show one that's Deep Sky Stacker plus GIMP, the GNU Image Manipulation Program, which is a free open source Photoshop alternative. And because Deep Sky Stacker is Windows only, for the first time due to popular demand, I'll also show a workflow in Cyril and GIMP for all you uh, Mac owners who want to use free open source software for your image processing. Okay, so that's the overview. Uh, as a beginner video though, I'm gonna be using fairly affordable gear and I'll also keep all of my capture techniques and my processing techniques as simple as I can. Now the processing techniques with this one might be a little bit uh, crazier because of our difficult starting conditions. So we're gonna have to do a little bit more, maybe working with channels and different things in Photoshop to tease out this uh, image and reduce the noise, but uh, I'm still gonna try to keep it understandable. Astrophotography can get really complicated really fast, um, but I want to emphasize that we can still take beautiful photos with the more affordable gear and even free software. Okay, so let's break down what I'm gonna be using tonight. We'll start with this. This is the mount I'm gonna use. Uh, it's the iOptron Smart EQ Pro. And this is a very lightweight mount. The way you know that is because I'm lifting it up with one hand. With most astrophotography equatorial mounts, this wouldn't be possible. The, the way they made this possible is that this mount is mostly plastic. Having a lot of plastic parts, um, it also makes it a fairly inexpensive computerized equatorial mount. It goes for around $500. The cons are, of course, that um, Plastic pieces don't hold up to as much use and abuse. You can see here I recently broke the battery door. Might have been partly my fault because I had some stuff hanging on it, so it wasn't really designed to do that, I guess, and I, and I put too much strain on that. Um, but now it's just taped on. Um, what these battery doors do is they're just a cover for the AA batteries inside. But there are, there are lots of... Um, pieces with this. Uh, we'll also see on the tripod the the 
the tray on the tripod is also held in just by sort of like a plastic pressure uh, clip like that. And with any kind of plastic pressure clip, there's a good chance it will break eventually just from using it too much. That's a downside. Um, the other major con with a lightweight mount like this is you just have to be really aware of how much weight you're putting on it. Um, and to succeed with this kind of mount, you really need to keep the weight well below the advertised limit. Um, and even with a light payload, like I'm gonna be trying to use, this mount will not be as accurate as a beefier, more expensive mount like my Skywatcher EQ6R, something like that. So I wanna emphasize this. If you have the money, um, definitely get a better mount. I would say the accuracy of the tracking on this is comparable to a Star Tracker style mount. Um, you know, those ones like uh, Skywatcher Star Adventurer that only track in right ascension. Um, the reason though, to possibly spend a little bit more money to get one like this over a Star Tracker package is that it's a bit more optimized to accept a small telescope out of the box. This is a saddle for a Vixen dovetail. Um, it also has, you know, the internal counterweight shaft. You don't have to clamp it on or anything like that. Very handy. Put the counterweights on, balance very quick. Um, I know a number of Star Trekkers now have internal polar scopes, but they don't all have them. This one does have it. Um, and then, of course, the thing that really separates it from most Star Trekkers is that it's go-to. So I can connect a hand paddle here and um, go to objects. I could, I could use this same port to connect to a computer um, and control it from my computer. That's sort of really what separates it. It's really though not necessary to follow along with this tutorial. So if you, if I get to a part where I'm using a hand paddle and you're not using this kind of thing, you're just manually pointing perfectly all right, th this is really an optional piece. So that's the mount. Uh, this is the scope that I'm gonna be using. And as you can see, this is a really small telescope. It's the AstroTech AT60ED. The 60 refers to the fact that it has a 60 millimeter front aperture, um, which is quite small. Um, I have many camera lenses that have a larger front aperture than that. Um, but the nice thing about a small doublet design like this, a doublet means that there's, there's only two pieces of high quality glass in here. And by having only two pieces of glass, it really keeps the weight down. Um, and there, I should say there's a couple more pieces of glass in the field flattener, which I really do recommend. I think the scope goes for a bit under $400, but then once you add on the camera angle adjuster, which lets you rotate, and the field flattener, it's, it's about $500. Uh, but you really, these really sort of make it an astrophotography scope. So if you're planning on buying something like this, definitely get the field flattener too. That's what, without this, it means that your stars along the edge will all be misshapen. With the field flattener, you, you'll get much better stars out to the edge. Maybe not all the way out to the edge of a full frame sensor, like I'm gonna be using today, but I'm planning to crop anyways, so it shouldn't matter too much. Anyways, other companies make a version of this same scope um, at similar prices, so if Astrotech or Astronomix is um, sold out, you can find it elsewhere. And some of you might be asking, um, why are we using this telescope when I do have other telescopes that would be better for photographing a galaxy? Well, for one thing, I really like a challenge and to see what can be done with smaller scopes and even camera lenses. And also, since this is a beginner video, I don't want to jump into using a big Newtonian um, because due to the weight and the size of a Newtonian, it really requires a very stable mount to get good results, like a, a mount that's at least $1,000. So even with a six inch newt, uh, very inexpensive, works pretty well. When you consider the mount and the coma corrector and the collimation tools and all that, there's just so much to buy and to learn about to get imaging with that. So this is much easier, especially if you are I've started with the photography world. You have, you, you're used to using lenses. This is basically like a lens. It just works a little bit better for astrophotography. It has a, 
uh, a really nice accurate focuser that can that can hold some weight um, and, and will stay in one position. Um, it has some mounting brackets if you want to mount stuff to it. So it's really just like a, a really nice camera lens that's quite the deal uh, for 360 millimeter focal length um, at this price point. But I'll mention here that if no matter what kind of gear you're using, feel free to try to follow along with this tutorial. Um, of course, galaxies other than Andromeda and the Magellanic Clouds are pretty small in the night sky. So the more focal length you have, the better. Once you get to this higher focal lengths, like 300 millimeters or more, you really need a tracker or a mount to uh, track the night sky. So there is some gear considerations here. Um, but if you already have a telephoto lens, you already have a star tracker, don't feel like you need to run out and buy a telescope right away. See what kind of results you can get with the gear you have first. To connect my camera to this telescope, I'm just using a generic T adapter designed for Canon cameras, Canon DSLRs. And since this is a full frame camera, I'm using a 48 millimeter T ring rather than the more standard 42 millimeters, which would be fine for crop sensors. The usual reason to use the wider T-ring is to get less vignetting when using a full frame camera. Anyways, the camera is my Canon 5D Mark III. It's not modified, that's a question I get a lot. Um, and by that, I mean uh, some people will modify their camera <clears throat> by replacing the stock UVIR cut filter, um, the one that comes with the camera. The one that lets in a little bit more of the red spectrum to get better response for H alpha uh, emission lines. Uh, for galaxies, this typically doesn't matter so much anyways. Um, there are H alpha regions in galaxies, but they're not the focus. Bro galaxies are thought of as broadband targets, meaning lots of colors, blues, yellows, all that kind of stuff. Um, and because they're made up of individual stars and stars range in color from blue to red. Um, the reason though uh, to do uh, a modification of your DSLR, I'll probably have videos on this later, is if you're shooting a lot of red nebulae, those HA and sulfur emission nebulae, um, it does make a difference. The DSLR I'm using, the Canon 5D, doesn't have a built-in intervalometer. An intervalometer is just a term, a fancy word for uh, a timer. It's, you, you see that the word interval is at the front of it, and so it's basically an interval timer. It, it allows you to um, take timed shots every so often, and you, uh, you can do a sequence of shots without having to ever touch your shutter. Um, an intervalometer also typically can act as a bulb timer, meaning that you can, if you're doing longer shots, like five minute uh, long exposures, it can count that down and uh, basically hit the shutter release, send a command to the camera at the right time. There are a lot of different options here, and people have been pointing them out in my comments a lot. Um, one that I haven't mentioned in the past is a lot of new cameras have apps that you can use. So Wi-Fi or Bluetooth apps that can do this. Another option is we can tether our camera with a USB cable to a laptop out on the field and use software like uh, some of them I know that are some that I know are Backyard EOS if you're using a Canon camera or Backyard Nikon if you're using Nikon or something like Astrophotography Tool. Um, and those can act as an intervalometer and a lot more too. Um, another option is an external intervalometer. And I've showed this in past videos. Basically you buy a little device and connect it to your camera and that can work. Tonight, I'm not going to be using any of those. I'm going to be using an internal intervalometer. And I know a lot of you might be thinking, well, in past videos, he said his Canon 5D doesn't have that. Well, I'm going to be using a firmware hack called Magic Lantern. And so if you're not a Canon DSLR user, you may want to skip ahead a few minutes because this is only going to apply to older Canon DSLRs that uh, can have this firmware hack put on them. Um, but basically what it is, is some developers have released these, this thing called Magic Lantern for free. It's supported on about a dozen older Canon DSLRs. I am not responsible if something happens to your camera, so I'm just telling you this information, but I don't hold me responsible if anything happens. With that said, what you do is you go to builds.magiclantern.fm. If your camera is supported, it'll be on that page. You can then download the zip file, follow the installation instructions that will be right on the page there, 
and it usually just involves copying the files to your SD card, running the firmware update, and after that, when you turn on your camera, again, you have Magic Lantern. The way to access it is you just press the trash button. You'll see all these Magic Lantern menus, including the shoot menu where there is now an intervalometer. Um, okay, so to just go over the options one more time, connect to a laptop, connect to a smartphone if your camera supports it, use an internal intervalometer if your camera already has one, if you have an older Canon DSLR, you can hack the firmware to get one, or lastly, and maybe most simply, just buy an external intervalometer. Uh, very simple devices that work really well. But tonight, I'm gonna to be using Magic Lantern because a lot of people in the comments sections and past videos have uh, told me that they wanna see this, um, and it's, it's firmware uh, that I think is quite stable. I've been using it for years, so we might as well check it out. Okay, then that's the camera. Again, Canon Vive T-Mark III, but it doesn't matter what camera you're using as long as it can shoot raw, as long as you can uh, take long exposures, go for it. Next piece of equipment though is a finder device. And the point of a finder device or a finder scope is to tell you where your camera is pointed at in the night sky. And some of you may be thinking, well, why not just use the camera itself? Why not just put on live view and it will tell you where you're pointed? Well, the issue with that is once you get past around, let's say 100 millimeters in focal length, this can be really difficult to do because a lot of times our deep sky object isn't near any bright stars that are gonna be in the field. So you, you try to move to where you think it is and you have no idea because it just looks like a bunch of random stars. Um, many star fields, are pretty indistinct. I, I take a photo of it and I don't recognize any star patterns. You can try to look in you know, an app on your phone, but it's often very difficult. And so this is where a finder is very helpful. They're all designed basically the same way. They offer a wider field of view than you're getting in the eyepiece or your camera. Um, <clears throat> and often some kind of indicator, like a dot or a target, or a crosshairs that shows you where you're pointed in the night sky, then all you have to do is just um, move that finder around um, until you know that you're pointed in the right spot. As long as it's aligned with your main telescope or your lens and the camera, then you know you're pointed in the right part of the sky. So I'm gonna go over some of the major types here of finder scopes. This one, this is a right angle corrected image finder scope. And it's my favorite for visual astronomy, but not my favorite for astrophotography. The way that this works is it's purely optical. Uh, the reason I like it for visual is with, when I'm using it with like a daub, like the one behind me, I like to keep things uh, completely optical, no electronics. It's really fun just to push things around and know everything you're looking through is just glass or mirrors. Um, basically the way this works though, it has this little built-in prism with a little crosshairs eyepiece and you just look through it and line up your object. Since I live in a really light polluted area here, uh, right near Boston, um, I mostly use my daub with this finder to view the planets and the moon. And since those objects are really bright, the finder scope is perfect for just looking down casually, pushing the daub over a little bit till it's centered and then I can look back in the eyepiece and know there's Saturn again, right? So it's really easy. This though for astrophotography, I don't find very useful. The field of view on this isn't very large and you're looking through it like this, usually with one eye closed. And so I don't find that it offers much advantage over just using live view on the camera. And we've already talked about why that has some problems um, when you're looking for hard to find deep sky objects. So don't recommend this for astrophotography, but if it's all you have, you can try it. Next type of finder is a Telrad. Um, this device is battery powered. I think it's one or two double A's. Um, and the way that it works is it basically uh, through a little mirror in there um, puts a red target right on top of the sky. So you can just actually look through it and you don't even need to close an eye. You can look through it with both eyes open. And as long as you're at the right angle, you'll see a red target right on the sky and you're also getting your whole you know your whole visions field of view as you're looking through this so this is really nice um, i can use it to star hop using bright constellations 
um, and the the red target is also adjustable um, right here. You can change the intensity of it right there. The downside to a Telrad is it's so large you probably wouldn't use it unless you're using a telescope and have a place to mount it like a finder shoe on a focuser like this. So for camera lens setups, I have two more options. The first one is the cheaper option. This is called a red dot finder. It's the exact same idea as a Telrad, but instead of a full target, you just get a single red dot to indicate where you are pointed. The last time type of finder and the one I'll be using tonight is a green laser finder. And the way this one works is it's just a green laser. That's really all it is. Um, and it's probably the most dangerous type to use. You don't want to shine this in someone's eyes, of course. Um, but since it's quite powerful, um, check with your local authorities to make sure you can use this. They're banned at most star parties on most observing fields um, because they can be a nuisance if you're doing astronomy with other people. And you also have to be super careful not to use them when an airplane is passing overhead because they have the potential to blind uh, the pilot or passenger if they're looking out the window or if you shine it right in the front cockpit. Um, so if you see a plane, stop using it. Uh, if you understand those safety precautions, it is a really nice finder uh, because it is very clear where you're pointed. And what I really like about it is at night, you can actually see the green laser beam all the way from the the laser itself up into the sky like you it like it, you see the solid laser beam and so it just makes it really clear exactly where you're pointed um, in the sky this one just connects right on to my dslr hot shoe with any of these finders you have to make sure that it's adjusted to be pointing at the same spot as the dslr or it's basically useless um, and what they all have for that is a little adjustment knobs and so the way I usually use this is I do a rough alignment inside. So I'll just shine the laser against a wall, see that the laser beam is roughly centered on screen on my DSLR. Then when I get outside, I'll do a finer alignment using Polaris, the North Star. Um, so after I do my polar alignment, I'll look on the camera's LCD, I'll see the Polaris is centered, and then I'll shine the laser on it and then adjust my laser until it's right on Polaris. And then I know the camera and the finder are aligned and I can trust what I'm seeing with the finder is the same place that uh, the camera is pointed. Okay, next piece of equipment, and I'll be talking more about this when we talk about calibration frames in a second here, is some kind of white illuminated panel or source of white light, like a, a white wall that's very even to take your flats. I'm gonna be using the Pegasus Astro Flatmaster, um, but it's not necessary to buy something for this. Just, you can just sort of use your imagination, try to get a very flat field and make sure that it's very flat against the front of your lens or telescope. So one thing I've done in the past that works pretty well is just get like a drawing app for an iPad or a laptop. Just put your uh, telescope or uh, camera lens like that, and then just put this right on top and take your flats. It's the exact same idea with the, the flat panel, the flat master, um, but this is, if you already have something, again, like a laptop or an iPad or something like that, just use it. Um, the important thing is just to get it very flat against the, the front surface and um, that it's evenly illuminated as best you can. You can also get LED um, tracing tablets that work really well. I have one of those too. Um, and I'll put a link in the description. This piece of equipment is optional, but I recommend it. It's a Badenov mask. You can make these yourself. I have a video about that if you're interested, or you can buy them for usually under $20. Um, and they just go in front of your scope or lens. And what they do is they create a diffraction pattern based on this uh, with really bright stars. It makes this sort of X shape with a center line and you just sort to, then it's very easy just to focus so that that center line is in the middle of the X. Um, and that's the confirmation that you're truly in focus at infinity on the stars. Unfortunately, we can't uh, 
just focus on something far away during the day unless you're sure that the temperature is very stable because when temperature shifts, so do the glass elements in a lens or telescope. And that shifting of the expansion or contraction of the glass is what can change the focus um, as the temperature changes. So ideally, you really even should check focus a few times during the night, let's say every half hour or every hour, to make sure that it hasn't shifted. Um, the last piece of equipment may also be optional. It really depends on the season, your location, a few different factors. But if you're, if it's spring or summer, you really might need this, especially if you're in a humid place. It's a dew heater band. Here's an example of one. This is a dew, no, this is an Astro Zap. I also use do not heater bands. Um, and basically uh, you need the dew heater band. You connect this around the front element of your telescope or your lens, and it keeps that front glass element a little bit warmer than the ambient temperature, and that prevents dew from forming on it. The reason to prevent dew is, of course, because if you get dew on your lens, your picture is gonna get all blurry um, from the, the water vapor and the condensation on the lens. Um, the thing I don't like about having one of these with a setup like this one is without it, I wouldn't have any cables running off the mount. The more cables you have running off the mount, the more things that can go wrong. But if you just have this one cable, it should be okay, as long as you just make sure it's not snagging on anything. Um, the way I have this running is just to a little home-built uh, dew heater controller a friend built for me. Um, and then that's running down to this kind of thing. And then I have a little uh, lithium ion battery pack for powering it. This setup is okay, especially if you are running more than one dew heater band. But if you just need one, what I recommend is getting something like this. This is a Kuwu USB powered uh, dew heater band. It's pretty simple. Um, it just has three settings, low, medium, or high. And it's pretty uh, inexpensive. And it just, again, is powered from USB. So you can just use like your laptop or a cheap um, uh, power bank like this that is good for like powering a smartphone. So multi-purpose, you just plug it in and uh, works really well. Really the only reason to get the more advanced dew heater controller is if you're mul or again running multiple dew heater bands, like one for your guide scope, one for your main telescope. So the major types of calibration frames again are bias, darks, and flats. Bias is probably the simplest. You can take them once and use the same bias frames for all your projects because they are just camera specific. They have nothing to do with any other conditions. Um, basically, they are just the noise that's inherent to your sensor called the fixed pattern noise. Um, and so uh, the way to take a bias frame is just set your camera's shutter speed to as fast as it possibly can go. So on most cameras, that's either one four thousandths of a second or one eight thousandths of a second, and take 50 of them. You stack them all together and you have a master bias frame. And again, you can just do that once and then keep reusing it. That's bias. Um, master dark is a, oh, and I should say about master bias, sorry. Um, it's, you, you want it to be completely dark. So you can just put the body cap on your camera, take it in a closet, take it in the dark um, at the same ISO you normally use, let's say ISO 800, and you have your bias frames. Dark, same thing. Put the body cap on the camera, take it in the dark, but we want to also match the shutter speed of our lights. Again, lights are the pictures of the night sky, and we wanna match the temperature that we took our lights at. Because the main thing that the darks do is they are to take care of thermal noise by subtracting it from the lights. And so thermal noise is the noise that builds up due to the sensor being warm. And so uh, if you're shooting in a really cold place, darks are less necessary, but the warmer it gets, the more darks are important. Uh, but I just would recommend shooting them anytime. And they'll also take care of other sensor peculiarities like amp glow and hot pixels and all these kinds of things that I won't explain right now, but um, are annoying when you see them. Hot pixels basically show up as these bright red, green, or blue 
all the way saturated, all the way really bright pixels that are quite annoying to see. Flats are to correct any dust that's either on the lens or anywhere in this system. So you could get dust on your field flattener, you can get dust on your camera's sensor, you can get dust almost anywhere. It's also to correct vignetting to some degree. Some vignetting is still gonna be there probably, but flats help correct it. They're often a little bit more challenging than darks or bias, but I recommend you start practicing now. Even if you're a beginner astrophotographer, I recommend doing flats, they're pretty important. Um, the way that we take them, uh, I've already said a little bit in the equipment section, is we just uh, put something flat against the front of the scope or point it very flat, flat on at, a, at an illuminated wall or something like that. And what we're trying to do when we take these is we want to um, meter or use the histogram to get a fairly even exposure. So a little bit under is better than a little bit over, I would say. So if you're using the meter, um, you can just you can either just meter exactly in the center or a little bit under. I wouldn't go over um, because you don't want to overexpose your flats. Um, but uh, a flat that's a good exposure is usually somewhere, if you're looking at the histogram, the histogram peak should be somewhere around uh, one third to one half over from the left. And uh, that's your, your shutter speed time. The ISO should be the same as your everything else. So keep the same ISO for everything. The shutter speed for the flats should be so that the exposure is about midway over. In my case, with a bright source like the Flatmaster, that's like a, very, a small fraction of a second. So usually with a DSLR and a bright white light source, it's going to be a small fraction of a second. Um, so they're very easy to take, take about 30. Start in the Q uh, menu here, which is the Q stands for quick menu. Um, on the Canon 5D, it looks like this, and it just lets you set a number of settings uh, quickly. Um, I'm going to be taking 30 second exposures tonight. I know for my skies, 30 seconds is uh, the most I can do at ISO 800. Um, you may find that with your skies you want to change this um, or with your camera and a different ISO setting might be uh, better for your conditions. Um, but usually um, on most cameras, especially Canon cameras, you, you want about 800 to 1600. Um, that sort of is a trade-off between read noise and dynamic range. On some newer uh, cameras, uh, especially ones with Sony sensors, you might be able to go down to a lower ISO and still get a good trade-off and get a little bit more dynamic range in your shot. For my camera though, 800 is good. Um, so 30 seconds, ISO 800. Initially here, um, since I wanna take some test exposures, I'm gonna change it from single shooting to self timer two seconds. And what that means is that after I hit the shutter button, it will wait two seconds before taking the exposure. And then that way I can use the shutter button so it's a little bit quicker, um, but it will also let me uh, avoid too much shake from hitting that shutter button. Okay, so that's all I have to really do in the quick menu. I want to use my main memory card, the bigger one, so it's already set that way. It's already set to raw, but we'll see a little bit more about that in the uh, main menu of the camera. Okay, now we're in the main Canon camera menu system, just the one you get by hitting menu. Um, and this may look a little bit different than your camera if you're not using a Canon camera, um, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to find all of these settings or at least most of them as you're going through your menus and setting it up for astrophotography. Uh, the first thing we're gonna start with here is image quality. And you don't need to uh, use the JPEG settings unless you want to turn that on to have a JPEG backup, but it's really not necessary because we're only gonna be using the raw setting. So I just wanna use the full raw setting, no need to uh, have a, a JPEG equivalent. Um, if your camera for some reason only shoots JPEG and not raw, then just use the highest quality JPEG 
uh, available. Okay, image review, I am going to turn off. Um, we could turn, we could leave it on for the initial uh, testing stage of, you know, taking our initial test exposures to nail focus and things like that, if you find it useful. But usually I need more than even eight seconds to look at one of those test exposures and I need to zoom in. So both of those things I need to do in playback mode. So I'm just gonna leave image review off. We definitely want it off when we actually start our round of exposures because um, every time it, uh, enables the LCD, that's going to heat up the camera and also have the possibility of causing stray light. So we want to turn it off. Beep, I'm also going to disable because I don't need sound. Um, release shutter without card. It doesn't really matter. We just want to make sure we do have an SD card inserted. Uh, we're not using a lens, we're using a telescope, so I'm going to leave that off. But if you were using a lens, this can be uh, useful to turn on the lens uh, vignetting correction. Speed light control is about external flash. We don't have to worry about that. Mirror lockup. This is useful if your camera does have it. What this does is it locks up the mirror uh, before it takes an exposure. If you do enable it, just keep in mind that you're going to have to um, let a little time elapse between exposures for it to lock up the mirror. Um, so I would maybe allow a few seconds for it to do that. Uh, you, can, you can also just leave it disabled and allow those few seconds between exposures to try to avoid camera shake as well. So uh, it is nice to have. I would recommend enabling it if you have it, but it's not absolutely necessary if you don't see it. Okay. Um, most of this uh, is about color, um, and most of it doesn't really matter if you're shooting raw, but if you are shooting JPEG, I would recommend daylight white balance or doing a custom white balance during the daylight um, with a gray card, but usually daylight white balance works fine for night sky stuff. Okay, picture style, again, that's a JPEG transformation thing. You can just leave it on standard, doesn't matter. Um, long exposure noise reduction, I would recommend turning off if you're following along with me because we're gonna take darks ourselves. If you don't wanna take darks, what this does if you enable it is it will take a dark immediately after you take your light and subtract it from the light. Um, it's not the way that I work, but some people do. So just so you know what that does, it takes longer, um, while you're under the night sky. And because I have so few clear nights, I usually turn it off and take my darks on a cloudy night uh, so that I get as much night sky time as possible. High ISO speed noise reduction, turn off. Um, a lot of these settings, I'm not sure if they're really gonna affect us in raw mode, but I would just recommend turning all of these things off. Live view shooting, exposure simulation, all of these things enable because I think they help you see the night sky better when you are framing things up. All of this is about autofocus. We can't use autofocus unless we're like, you know, maybe on the moon or something like that. Uh, for most cameras, they're not gonna be able to autofocus on the stars, so it really doesn't matter. And we're gonna be using a telescope, so autofocus doesn't apply to that either. Um, all of these are about playback stuff. So again, doesn't really matter. Uh, here, uh, I would always recommend formatting your card uh, before you start. I'm using a fairly big card here, uh, so I don't need to do it right now. But if you were, for instance, using like a 32 gigabyte card, uh, you might fill that pretty quickly. So I would recommend uh, backing everything up and formatting before you get out under the night sky. So you have plenty of room to take your pictures and don't have to worry about uh, filling it up. Okay, auto rotate, uh, I would recommend turning off. Um, once in a while, I have seen this uh, confuse uh, image processing software, especially the stacking software, when you have auto rotate turned on because uh, basically the it's then recorded in the raw file which way the camera is rotated and the, the imaging software might read that in and think that two pictures have um, are incompatible because one's in landscape mode and one's in, in portrait mode or something like that. So I would just recommend turning it off and then you won't run into any of those problems. Auto power off, I usually disable that. Um, it's really up to you, uh, but I don't, I don't 
find it uh, helpful because like when I'm out on the field, I don't want to be doing something and then have to turn the camera back on because uh, it turned it off automatically. So I usually disable that. Okay, I don't think any of these other things matter. So I think we've gone through all the menu settings that matter for astrophotography. Um, next, I'm just gonna quickly show you um, Magic Lantern, um, which is a whole other set of menus, um, uh, but then we'll use it more out on the field. Okay, here's Magic Lantern. Um, it has a whole other set of menus. Some of these settings we've already seen in the quick menu, like the shutter speed and the ISO, and some of these settings we saw in the more advanced Canon menu. So some things are repeated, but then many settings in here are uh, unique to Magic Lantern. Um, so being able to set up different uh, displays and things like that. Um, most of these uh, are not particularly important to uh, astrophotography. Uh, again, this is the, the movie settings, so we're gonna skip over those. Here's the shoot settings, and this is where we're really gonna use Magic Lantern tonight, which is this intervalometer setting right here. Um, and you can turn it on just by hitting the set. I already have it set up to sort of uh, be how I want it tonight. Um, well, except for the how many shots it's gonna take, we're actually gonna take many more than 30, so you just move the dial to change that. Um, and start after, I might raise that up a little bit too. Um, but basically, this is a very simple intervalometer, um, and I like how they've laid out the language here. It just says, take a pick every whatever. And so if we're doing 30 second exposures and I wanna leave a little bit of time in between the exposures for either the mirror to settle or for the mirror to lock up, I would set this a little bit higher than the number of seconds that our exposure is. So a couple seconds higher than whatever you have your exposure setting at or your shutter speed. Um, so our shutter speed, our exposure time is set to 30 seconds. So I'm gonna say take a pick every 32 seconds. Um, then these are about with how to start this sequence and when to start it. Um, so this is gonna start after we leave the Magic Lantern menu, after 13 seconds, it'll start the sequence, and then it'll stop after we've taken 67 shots in this case. I'll probably raise that up tonight to many hundred um, because uh, the, the Big Dipper is, is high in the sky and will be up most of the night, so we can, we can get off hundreds of shots um, over the course of the night. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn that intervalometer back off until we're ready to use it. I will also note, it, note here, uh, and again, this only applies to Magic Lantern, that uh, Magic Lantern gives you more uh, power over how the mirror lockup works. Um, so I can turn the mirror lockup to be always on, and I can set actually a delay for how, for when to take the exposure after the mirror locks up. So the default here is one second. So if I set my interval time to 32 seconds, that gives us one second for the mirror to have lock up and have that delay before it takes the exposure. So that should be enough. But if you were concerned about mirror shake, you could, you could do something higher. So you could do like a three second delay and then set your interval time to something like 35 seconds. Um, so, this, um, this level of control in Magic Lantern can be really nice. We'll look at this again when we get out onto the field a little bit. Um, oh, I should also mention, sorry, one more thing about this. If you are setting your um, camera to bulb mode, you can then set the bulb timer right here, and this will allow you to go um, longer than 30 seconds. Um, so you can do like five minute exposures right in camera. And again, this is, a, this is something that's only uh, often available on external intervalometers normally, but Magic Lantern adds this right into the Canon menu system. But I'm gonna turn that off because we're just gonna be doing 30 second exposures. But if you do have a dark site or something like that and you, and you wanna use longer exposures, you have a premium mount or something like that, then you can you can set up that bulb timer. There's just a couple last things to do before we get on the field. One is to remember to charge up your batteries, including the DSLR battery. Um, so just remember hours before you're ready to go out to charge. 
And if you have extra batteries, charge all your extra batteries. Um, just in case, I like to have multiple copies of everything. You never know when you might run out of juice. Um, if your tracker runs off an internal battery, make sure to charge your tracker. If it runs off double A's like mine, then just bring extra double A batteries. The worst thing is to get out there and realize all your batteries are dead and you need to charge them to keep going. Last thing is we need to prepare how to actually find our deep sky object. In this case, we're gonna be shooting M101, the pinwheel galaxy, which is actually a pretty easy target to locate with some basic star hopping. The basic idea here is we're not gonna be able to see M101 with our naked eye or with the camera because of the amount of light pollution we're gonna be dealing with. But we will be able to see the stars of the Big Dipper. Um, the Big Dipper is a bright asterism. It's not actually a constellation. It's in the Northern Hemisphere. It's part of the Ursa Major constellation. In America, we call it the Big Dipper. I've heard in other parts of the world, they might call it the Plow. But in any case, um, the Big Dipper is very easy to spot. Uh, it's very distinctive. M101, the pinwheel, happens to form a triangle with the, the last two stars in the Big Dipper's handle. So all we have to do is we make sure our camera is on the right side of these two stars, and then we center it on an imaginary spot that makes up the third point of that equilateral triangle with these two stars. This case was pretty easy. More advanced star hopping involves you know, going multiple jumps from a really bright star to a less bright star until we find our object eventually. Um, I'm gonna do a video about star hopping someday, but for M101, like I said, shouldn't be too hard. Just find the handle of the Big Dipper or the plow and make that triangle with the last two stars in the handle. You found M101. Okay, let's get out to the field. Well, now I'm outside. Uh, all the forecast said clear, but of course it's cloudy. Uh, happens to me a lot, nothing you can do about it, but we'll see if uh, after I get everything set up here, if the clouds clear and we can actually shoot a galaxy tonight. Um, so I've set up my tripod here. Um, this is the official tripod spreader that comes with the Optron mount. Um, it's a little plastic doohickey here, but I don't really like very much because I always feel like I'm gonna break it when I put it in there. Um, but that does an okay job at uh, making the tripod a little bit more rigid. But I, I uh, built this, this wooden tripod spreader that I like a little bit better. Um, just makes it a little beefier, a little bit more stable. All right, uh, so I have it on here now. Um, I do have the tripod raised up a little bit uh, just for demonstration. Typically, I'll, for imaging, I'll have my tripod in the lowest possible position. There is really no wind tonight, so um, it's probably okay to have a little bit raised up, but if you feel any wind, you really want your tripod as low as possible. The other thing I'm doing here is uh, when I line up the tripod, I want this little registration pin. I don't know if you can see that, this little pin right here, that's what uh, you're going to adjust your uh, azimuth corrections against. Um, and basically there's two little screws uh, push against that. And so you want that is lined up with the uh, North Celestial Pole as best as you can. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, just look up at the sky, find Polaris, which is at the end of the little dipper, and just try to point this registration pin uh, right at Polaris. Uh, if you're a little bit off, that's okay, but, uh, but you wanna try to get that as close as possible. It'll sort of save you some time later on when we get to the polar alignment step. Okay, next thing we're gonna do here is we're gonna put the mount head on the top here. And then there's a little locking mechanism below that I'm gonna screw in. All right, the latitude adjustment on this mount needs this uh, screw. Um, so we're gonna put that in right here. Okay, and there's a little latitude gauge right here. Um, so I just 
uh, did it roughly 45 degrees, um, uh, but we'll, we'll fine tune that in a second here. Um, and you can see that when I transport them out, I, I have these axes uh, um, loose, uh, but then once we get it set up here, we can go ahead and, and lock those down like so. And this is, uh, let me tilt up here a little bit. This is called the home position. Uh, basically with the counterweight shaft uh, pointed towards the, the Polaris, the North, the North Star, or if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, the, the Southern Celestial Pole. Um, once we have the mount secure on here and we've locked it down, we can put the counterweights on the counterweight shaft. Okay, I'm just gonna put one counterweight on there to start and um, sort of in the middle, because I don't remember uh, how heavy this uh, payload is gonna be. So we'll put the payload on the top here and then we'll adjust the counterweight up and down uh, to balance it in a second. Um, I always suggest putting your, your counterweights on first before you put on your telescope. Um, I just feel that's a bit safer uh, to have the counterweight already there. If you put the telescope on first, then if, if, the, if it's really out of balance, you might have a crash and, and break your telescope. So I think it's always better to put the counterweight on for the telescope. Okay, now I have everything attached, uh, including my laser pointer finder, uh, my little simple dew heater controller and dew heater band, and uh, the hand controller. I just put some uh, 3M dual lock uh, fasteners, it's sort of like waterproof Velcro, on the back of this and on the front of the mount as an easy place to put it. The next step in setup is we want to balance the mount. Um, this mount is a little bit tricky to balance in declination just because it's a little bit sticky here, but it should be easy enough to balance this way. Oops. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm seeing uh, which side is heavy. And so I can see right now the counterweight side is the heavy because when I let go, it's swinging to that side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to push the counterweight up here on the counterweight shaft. Until it balances. All right, so now it balances in both directions. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, line this back up and lock down that axis. Okay, the next step is we're going to take off this cap here. and take off the cap in the front and polar align. And this is something that's hard to show with the light on because I can't uh, see the uh, through the polar scope with that bright light on. Um, at some point I wanna do like a full video on polar alignment that'll be more helpful. But basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look into that polar scope and line up uh, Polaris in a circle uh, where it's supposed to go. And the way that I usually figure out where Polaris is supposed to go is I just uh, bring up an app and uh, the app tells me, well, for an Ioptron mount, this is what the circle looks like. This is where Polaris should be for your location and time right now. Um, so I look at that app and then I look in the polar scope and do my rough polar alignment. A lot of times I'll follow up with a more precise polar alignment with something called the QHY Pole Master, which I plan to do tonight, um, but it's not necessary when you're starting out. When you're starting out, uh, just using the polar scope is, is just fine. But you wanna try to get as accurate as possible, which is why I recommend using a smartphone app for this. Okay, um, I'm gonna turn off the light and do the polar alignment.
Okay, if you happen to use a QHY pole master, you can watch this section. If not, uh, you can just skip over it. I'm going to show uh, how to do a fine polar alignment now with the pole master. So I've put the pole master adapter into the borehole right there on the mount, and then we just snap in the pole master like that and tighten these locking screws on the side. And for uh, the best uh, experience with the software, you want the USB pointed this way. So if you're facing your mount, it should be pointed to the left. Uh, it doesn't matter too much, but it, it, it makes the directions uh, when you're adjusting things make more sense on screen. Okay, and then I'm just going to put in the supplied USB cable there, and that has locking screws too. Okay, and that's uh, all installed, so now we'll move over to the computer uh, to finish up. Because uh, the Pole Master is mostly just, you just put it on um, with the, the axis of the mount, um, you know, where, uh, where you normally pull or align from, and then you just move to the software side to actually understand the polar alignment. Um, once we're in the software, we're just going to be controlling, uh, we're just going to be adjusting it to get a, a finer polar alignment with two, two different sets of knobs. Um, the azimuth adjustments are down here, and those just uh, work against a registration pin that's right there. And then the altitude adjustment is uh, this thing right here for sort of fine control, and if we need some major adjustment, we could, we could loosen up this, uh, this bolt back here. Um, and okay, so we'll move to the software now. I'm um, gonna go ahead and make this full screen. And then I'm just gonna use these scroll bars to roughly center Polaris, which is the only sort of brighter star on screen. I'll go ahead and raise up the exposure time a little bit. The goal here is to make these stars around it bright enough to clearly see. So if I raise it up to 200 milliseconds, now I can see all of those. You can also play around with um, the gain too, if you want, but um, in this case, it's just making it noisier and I'm not actually seeing any more stars. So I'll leave that alone and click finished. I'll double click Polaris again and uh, Use this little rotate slider thing here. And I find that when you're just using this rotate slider by hand to try to match up the stars, it's very easy just to shoot past it uh, when you're close. So then the easiest thing to do is either you can use these buttons, the minus and plus, to make small adjustments, or you can use the left and right arrow keys, which is my preference. And so I'm just going to use the left and right arrow keys until I have this all matched up. I can just double check by moving this up and down. Yep. And I'll say success. And it says, would you like to use the axis center position recorded last time you used Pole Master? I'm going to say no, because I was using a different mount the last time I was using the Pole Master software. So we have to re-record this. It now knows that this star is Polaris, so I can pick any star out here to, to use for this step. Um, I'm going to pick this one way out here, and I'm going to double click it as the instructions say. Then it says to rotate the RA axis in the direction of the arrow. So we're going to loosen up the RA clutch here and move that star up here. double click it, or no, say finished, then double click it again, and then do that same thing again. It's now up here, finished, double click, okay, and then we're just going to loosen up the clutch one more time and watch that star 
as it moves back to where it was and make sure that it's roughly staying on that green circle. We're a little bit off uh, just because this is a cheap mount, uh, but that's okay. It's pretty close to that staying on that green circle. I'll say correct. I'll double click Polaris again. Use my left arrow key to put these stars back into the pattern and click success. Okay, and now this shows us how far I was off with just my rough polar alignment um, using the pol polar alignment scope uh, built into the Ioptron Smarty Q. Um, so we have to now move Polaris from here to this crosshairs in the rotating circle right here. And um, it's mostly gonna be an azimuth move because uh, we're pretty close to the right altitude. Um, so I'm gonna start with those azimuth adjustment knobs. And this is a, a live view. So as I'm moving these knobs, you can see it moving on screen. Okay, now we're pretty much lined up in azimuth, so now I just have to raise the mount up a little bit in altitude. Okay, now we're getting quite close. I'm just going to use the azimuth adjusters again. And you have to sort of work them both at the same time. You loosen one while you're tightening the other to make it move. Okay, that looks right on. I'm gonna click finished. It says double click it again. And use the rotate slider or just the arrow keys. I'll say success. And now we click the start monitor button. And what we're looking for here is that that green target stays basically centered within that red circle. Um, the red circle is where our mount is pointed and the green target is the celestial pole and it's monitoring this in real time. The reason it's jumping around a little bit is because of the seeing the atmospheric turbulence in the air. And let's just try to fine tune this a little bit. It's going to be difficult on, oh, maybe that did it. No, let's see. It's a little better jumping around a bit, so it's hard to say. I think that's close enough for our purposes. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say finished again and close out of this application. The next thing I like to do um, to try to get a little bit better with um, the first go-to command, the accuracy of that when we're doing the three-star alignment is to make sure that the, the mount is truly in the home position now that we have it polar aligned. And what I mean by that is that Polaris, which right now is right there on the screen, um, should be roughly centered. Um, so I'm just going to loosen up the declination axis here and just nudge that back and forth. That's pretty good until Polaris is centered as much as it can be this way. Um, and I just f find that that helps uh, get you closer uh, with your first go-to command um, or your first um, alignment if you're doing like a three-star uh, star alignment um, to refine the go-to. And the other thing we can do at this point, you're probably not going to be able to see it very well. Hold on, let me turn on my headlamp here, is remember I'm using this um, laser finder scope. Um, and so I'm gonna just adjust this at this point to make sure that it's pointed at Polaris 2. And the way I'm gonna do that is just look for airplanes, make sure that I'm not, um, that I'm safe to shine the laser. And then if I don't see any airplanes uh, coming, um, I'm going to just press down 
right there to shine the laser. Look up at where it's pointed um, in the sky. I can see the green laser beam and um, then adjust it with these knobs until it's pointed at Polaris. So then I know the camera and the laser finder are, are now aligned, which is important. If you're not using a laser finder, but a Telrad or a red dot finder, you would do this same thing uh, to make sure that the two things are aligned, meaning they're both pointed and centered on the same star. You need to do this before you can trust what you're seeing with the finder. So that's all done. Now we can move on to uh, turning on the mount and doing a couple star alignment before we move on to M101. Okay, I've now turned on the mount and I have the hand controller right here. I'm gonna start by setting the time and sight. And that's actually looking pretty good. It remembered most of uh, everything that's the right time. The next thing after setting the time and sight information, uh, which you can find uh, like on your smartphone app, I'm just using Polar Finder Pro here to find my GPS um, location and the current time and date. Um, the next step is we're gonna go to alignment. And I'm gonna do a two star alignment, meaning we're gonna use two stars we know in the sky to align the go-to application to align the mount so that it can um, then get more accurate at its go-to at the ability to go to any object okay and then this is an alphabetical list we're just going to hit down or no it's not an alphabetical list it's a list of brighter stars that are good to align to so we're just going to hit down till we find one that we like okay and i found one uh doobie um, is in uh, the Big Dipper, so that's where we're sort of headed, that's where I want to go. So I'm going to use that as my first alignment star. I'll just hit enter here, and the mount starts slewing. Okay, it then says use the arrow keys to center the target and then press enter. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to use our uh, laser finder and possibly live view to get it even more centered. Um, and then use these arrow keys to center it using the laser and live view. Um, I'm not gonna show this because it's just sort of uh, cumbersome right now because the camera's pointed straight down, but you can just uh, believe me that we, we are doing this. And uh, it's really pretty easy, especially uh, if you do have a laser finder like we do here. And now I found another star, Fecta, that we can also align to in the Big Dipper. The reason I'm staying in the Big Dipper is because M101 is very close to there. If you align on a few stars close to your object, that's going to work a lot better um, for fine-tuning the alignment here. Okay, so we'll do this again. And uh, I should note that when you're done um, aligning... So first I'm going to slew. It's slewed, and now it says use the arrow keys to center and then press enter. So after I'm done aligning with the arrow keys, um, we press enter. Uh, one other thing I should mention here is if it's going too slow, you can change the rate of the, of the slewing around um, with these buttons. So nine is the max, one would be slowest. And so I usually start on you know, five or six, and if it's really off, you can go up to nine, um, but usually around four or five or six uh, works pretty well for me on this mount. Okay, now I'm going to do uh, focusing with this Batonov mask. We just um, put it on the front of the scope like this um, and then take some exposures and uh, we try to line up that center spike between in the X pattern. Um, this scope has a very nice two-speed focuser, which I'll show right now. Okay, so we're going to rack the focus in one direction, just a little bit, about a quarter turn. That looks good. Just to test that, I'm going to go ahead and take a six-second exposure with the Badenov mask on. See that? So that's good focus with the Badenov mask because that central spike is uh, right in between the other two. And I'll go ahead and take it off now. 
Okay, we've done our uh, two star alignment. Uh, we've focused on a bright star, and now we can go ahead and move to M101. So I've just chose the select and slew. I'm going to go down to Messier catalog and type in M101. Enter. It slews to it. And uh, now we'll take some test exposures and see how close we are. Maybe we'll have to do a little recentering, but uh, should work. Okay, so uh, I've hit the trash button, which uh, because I've put Magic Lantern firmware on this camera has been keyed to open up Magic Lantern. It gives me this little uh, information about uh, the versioning and telling me that this is a nightly build. I'm just going to press the set key uh, to enter the menus. Here's the different um, Magic Lantern menu system. Um, there's a lot of different things in here and I'm not going to go over much of it because we're just going to be using it for the intervalometer function, uh, which is under the shoot menu. So that's five over from the left in this little camera icon. I'm going to go down and if I just press the set key, that just turns it off and on. If I press the Q uh, button, then that's where I can set up the settings here. Um, so I'm going to change this to 32 seconds, meaning that um, we're going to do 30 second exposures. There will be a two second uh, interval between them, and then it'll take another 30 second picture. Um, I'm going to have the start trigger be leaving the Magic Lantern menu. You can also set it to a half shutter press or just to start after you take the first picture. Leaving menu is fine. This start after means after we leave the menu, how long do we want it to wait before it starts the sequence of exposures? 12 seconds seems fine. If you feel like you need a little bit longer to get out of the vicinity of the mount so you're not stomping around it, go ahead and set that higher. And then this last one, stop after. If you're just planning to do you, your darks or uh, flats first because uh, you want to get those out of the way before you take your lights, you could just do 30. We're going to jump right into our lights here. Um, and so I'm going to set this to 400. Okay, and this last one, ramping options, that's if you were, uh, that's a more advanced option if you were doing a time lapse. But since we're not doing a time lapse, we don't need to turn that on. I'll press Q again to exit. The intervalometer is still off. To turn it on, I just press the set key. It now says on, and then I can just leave the menu by pressing the trash button. And it will start the sequence after 12 seconds. Okay, before we jump into pre-processing, let's take a look at one each of a bias, dark, flat, and light, just to give you an idea of what they look like in their raw state before we do any calibration or stacking. So I'm just going to uh, double click these to open them up in Adobe Camera Raw. Um, at first glance, the bias and the dark look exactly the same. Um, they both just look completely black. But if we stretch them a little bit by just moving the exposure uh, slider all the way over to the right, plus five stops, uh, we can see they look a little bit different. Uh, they both have vertical and horizontal uh, banding, um, but the bias frame looks fairly clean in terms of hot pixels, while the dark frame has a number of very bright hot pixels um, which show up as these bright red, green, or blue um, hot pixels in the frame. And the reason that some appear bigger than just a single pixel is because of the way that the Bayer matrix works. Um, they'll expand uh, beyond just the pixel that they uh, appeared on originally. So that's hot pixels. Uh, Basically, the bias frame is just the fixed pattern noise on the sensor, so you can see there's some uh, random sort of salt and pepper-like stuff there. 
Um, and also, but what's more important than the random salt and pepper stuff is these lines that we see because those should be fixed on the sensor and we can remove those kinds of uh, fixed lines in the calibration process just like we can remove hot pixels uh, with the darks. Okay, and then here is the flat. Um, I'm just going to actually uh, bring the exposure on this one down a little bit just to show you. Uh, hold on, let me try increasing the contrast. No, it's going to work. There we go, bring up the whites a little bit. Just to show you, there's, there's a little bit of vignetting in the corners. Um, and if we zoom in, there's an example of some kind of dust moat. You can see it's a little bit of a circular little pattern that's an out of focus uh, piece of dust or something like that. Uh, there's a couple of them here. Um, so yeah, so that's a flat. And then finally our 1 32nd light. Um, looks like this. Uh, M101 should be right here in the middle. If I zoom in, you can barely make it out there. Uh, let me try playing around with these sliders a little bit to see if I can help at all. And you can see when I when I stretch just a single 30 second image, the it's so noisy, especially without calibration, that it doesn't do much help. Uh, but believe me, there are spiral arms of a galaxy right there. Once we get through the whole pre-processing stage and can subtract the light pollution, you will see that galaxy is right there. Uh, that's M101. Um, I've been doing this a lot enough that I can sort of recognize, okay, yeah, there's like a fuzzy little thing right there that's clearly the galaxy actually it stands out a little bit better i think when you when you zoom out um, so that's about what you get in a single light exposure uh, meaning you know, the single shot of the night 30 seconds but again we're going to stack hundreds of these so our final exposure will be sort of uh, a combination of about uh, a few hours of data okay so hopefully that uh, sort of showed you what the different uh, frames look like, the light, and then the three calibration frames, the flat, the dark, and the bias. Now we're going to take all of these and move on to pre-processing. I've switched over to my Windows laptop now, and the reason is is because Deep Sky Stacker is a Windows-only program. Um, if you are interested in free stacking on a Mac or Linux machine, I am going to make a video about Cyril uh, as well, which also does this same kind of stacking process. But I do like Deep Sky Stacker if you do have a Windows computer because of how simple it is, and it generally gives you also very good results. So the first thing that I'm going to do in Deep Sky Stacker, you may not have to do. Um, it depends on how much internal storage your computer has. I know that I'm running a little bit low on local storage or internal storage. So I'm going to go down here to the settings option under options and click on stacking settings. Then under stacking parameters, this little window that opens up right here, I'm going to go on to the tab all the way over to the right called Output. And I've already set it here previously, but um, normally this would say something like C drive, and it would put it in a temporary folder on your C drive, which is your local storage drive, your internal hard drive. Um, I'm working on a laptop with a small SSD, and I know that this temporary folder often uh, grows to gigabytes and gigabytes while you're working in Deep Sky Stacker. After you close out the program, it does delete it, but while you're working, you need a very big temp folder. So what I've done here is I've clicked on this little um, button with the three dots, and I've told it to instead use a temp folder that I just created on my external hard drive, which here is called 2019 Backup, and it's the D drive on the computer. And so, whoops, I just accidentally set it to the D drive. I want to set it to the temp folder on the D drive, just to keep things a little bit more organized. There we go. 
And once I've done that, I can go ahead and click OK, and it will remember that setting. It will even remember that setting the next time you open Deep Sky Stacker, if you were wondering, um, assuming you have that external hard drive connected. Okay, next we're going to, now we're going to actually get onto the main show, which is starting at the top here over on the left and just working down this list of things to do, um, starting with open picture files. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to navigate to my folder, M101 folder, that's on my external hard drive. And I've already organized the files into these four folders using um, Adobe Bridge. But you can also just use uh, your file system to do this. Um, because as you can see, when I open one of those folders, it does give me a preview so I can see that all of these are lights. If you have to see them even bigger, you can change it to extra large icons. And I can see that there are stars in there. Um, okay, uh, but anyways, what we're doing now is we're opening up all of our lights. So instead of just clicking on one and clicking open, I want to first select them all. So I'm gonna click on one and then I'm gonna press Control A to select all of my lights and then click open. Just to show you that it worked, I can scroll through here and you can see they're all highlighted, meaning they're all selected. And if I click open, you can see that it brings these all into a list right here, like that. Now, for some reason, Deep Sky Stacker, when you bring in this first uh, batch of lights, it doesn't select them all. Um, the reason it does this, I think, is because what Deep Sky Stacker expects you to do is to go through your lights one by one perhaps and check the ones that you want to use. If you've already checked your light frames in a different program like I did in Adobe Bridge, you don't have to do this process and you could just go over here on the left hand side and click check all to check all your light frames. So you can see I now have 392 checked. I did leave in a bad light frame here just to show you what the process might be like if you were manually checking these in Deep Sky Stacker. So this second one I know is a fairly good light frame. And if I just move my mouse over a star, sorry, it's a little bit tricky with the trackpad. Okay, there we go. So if you look over here in the left hand side, this is a 100% zoomed in view. And you can see the star is a little bit uh, ovular, a little bit egg shaped, but that's okay. Um, I don't expect this to be perfect. Um, but that's, that's a fairly uh, round star, right? And if I look at a, a few more stars, uh, try to find a big one here. Yeah, that one is nice and round. Um, so that looks like a good frame. And if I just click on another random frame here and look at that same big star, again, it's a little bit off, but fairly round. That one looks pretty round, right? Okay, so all of these frames are looking pretty good so far, but now let me show you a bad frame to show you what that would look like. And it's this first one here, I left it in purposefully. If I move my mouse over this, you can see that star looks quite weird. It looks sort of doubled up. And then if I look at another one, the same thing. If I look at yet another one, same thing. Another one, same thing. They all have this left to right double pattern. Um, and the reason this happens is, um, well, there's lots of reasons it can happen. The reason I think it happened uh, here is because I was probably still walking around the mount um, when I was leaving after I'd set it up to take a bunch of exposures. And because the ground was wet, the mount shake, shook a little bit, and that gave me these double stars. So I don't want to use this frame in my final result because it might just leave um, a little trace of that double star. So what I wanna do is I wanna remove it from the list. The easiest way to do this is just to right click on it and choose remove from list. And you can see our total number of light frames went down from 392 down to 391. And so you could do this just moving through for each frame and examine them all. Um, if you have another program that you prefer, you can do it in there and then just bring, all, bring in the ones that you know are good. 
Um, oh, I'll also mention really quickly here that it does also have this thing up here, which lets you brighten up the picture, just like that. It's marginally useful when you have this much light pollution, because uh, we still can't really see any kind of deep sky object, but I just let you know that that's a, that's a temporary stretch of your image. So it doesn't do anything to the final image, it's just for you to view um, right here. Okay, uh, that's enough about lights. I'm gonna leave all of those checked, and then we're gonna go over here back to the left-hand side and open up our dark files. And we'll go into our M101 folder, click on the first dark, press Control A to select them all, open them up. Um, dark frames, it doesn't, D Deep Sky Stacker doesn't think that any of those are gonna be bad or that there's any real reason to examine them, so it immediately checks them all. So you can see as soon as I brought those in, um, it brought in all 30. Same thing with the other calibration frames. So I'll bring in my flats here. And I didn't do dark flats because these flat frames, if we scroll down to the flats and then scroll over, you can see that um, there's a lot of cool information here actually. Um, these flat frames are only 1 25th of a second. And uh, because they're only 1 25th of a second, that's not much time for dark current to build up, um, also called thermal noise. And so the, usually the only reason to do dark flat frames is if you're having a problem with bias calibration or if your flats are particularly long, like 10 or 20 seconds, and you're worried about thermal noise in them. But with such short exposures, I'm not too worried about uh, thermal noise, and so I'm going to not use dark flats. But we are gonna use bias, so I'm gonna click on the bias files here, make sure I'm in my biases folder, and click on the first one, press Control A to select all, and click open. And I shot 50 bias frames, mostly just because they are so short to take. Um, if you are at all unsure about which are your bias frames and which are your dark frames, Another thing you could do is you could just open up all of your pictures and then uh, sort of go through here and find, okay, well, here's all my bias frames. They're one eight thousandths of a second. There's my flat frames. They're one twenty-fifth of a second. And there's my dark frames because they're 30 seconds to match my lights. So you can use Deep Sky Stacker to figure out which files are which and then just reload them in as darks, flats, and bias, if you were, if you hadn't already organized them as such. Just wanted to show you that exposure column, just in case it's useful. Uh, the other thing I can check here is that everything is the same ISO. If I scroll up to bottom, to bottom to top, yep, everything is at ISO 800, which is good. All right. Uh, this point, if I were doing this live with people, I'd probably ask if there are any questions, but uh, if I've missed anything, always just ask me in the comments because I, uh, you know, I'm doing this live, but I, it's, it's hard without an audience. Um, okay, so we have everything loaded up here. Um, everything is checked. I know that because um, it has these numbers right here. So for instance, if I clicked uncheck all, you can see they all reset to zero. If I click check all, then we have them all, except for the dark flats, which we didn't take. So that's what you wanna see before we move on to the next step, which is we wanna click on this register checked pictures. Okay, and basically in Deep Sky Stacker, I use the defaults for the most part. Um, I find that the defaults work pretty well for most kinds of pictures. And really the only reason to move off of the recommended settings is if you are a more advanced user who knows uh, a bit more about astrophotography and aren't getting the results you want. Um, I'll just show you a couple things here though. If you, some of these things might be if you run into problems. Um, so the first thing is if you are running into problems, a lot of times it's because you, you're having trouble with registering your pictures together. 
And um, a lot of that comes down to this star detection threshold. Uh, what this basically means, I think it starts usually at 15% or so, is it's the detection threshold is how big a star it's going to look at before it counts it as a star. So if we move this to the left and we lower the threshold, then it's going to let in smaller stars. But at a certain point, it might be confusing a star with a hot pixel or other random noise in your picture. And so if we click that, you can see at 7%, it's, con it's uh, finding 405 stars. If we bring it up to 65%, now it's only finding 32 stars. So what is the right number of stars to avoid it latching on to noise? Um, it's hard to say exactly. It really just depends on so many factors. But what I usually do is I try to look for a threshold where it's finding a, a few hundred stars, a couple hundred, maybe between 200 and 300 stars. Of course, this really depends a lot on focal length. So if you are doing Milky Way shots or something like that, it might find thousands of stars and that could be perfectly normal. So uh, don't let uh, the exact number of stars be your guide. Um, really, it's just you might need to change this threshold if you're having problems with registration. Usually there's no reason to, to change it off of the default unless you're running into issues. Okay, next thing here is where it says stack after registering. I think that starts off um, unchecked, but I usually just go ahead and check it. Um, that means that we're just gonna get through everything right now. The other option is if you uncheck it, you could just register your pictures, then uh, Deep Sky Stacker applies a score to every picture, and then you could use the best uh, picture to do uh, to re-register and, and, and stack and everything. I just don't find it particularly necessary with this kind of thing. So I'm going to go ahead and click stack after registering. Um, and where it says select the best percentage of pictures, you can set this to whatever you want. So if you're not sure about you know the quality of your pictures, you might want to set it lower. Um, I'm fairly sure that these are fairly consistent, so I'm gonna set it higher. I'm gonna set it to 95%, meaning that the worst 5% in terms of the stars being out of round, it's going to throw out before it stacks them all together. Um, next thing we can do here is, there's two buttons down here, there's recommended settings, and basically all you wanna do here is make sure that it's not throwing any big errors at you. If, there, if it was throwing any big errors, it would, they would show up in red. Um, and then there's stacking parameters. And this is where it gets a lot more advanced, but the good thing is, again, the defaults in Deep Sky Stacker are quite good. So there's really no reason uh, to change any of these unless you really want to. Um, basically, what just a straight I'll just explain quickly what a stacking mode is. A straight average would mean that it doesn't do any weighting. It just it it just looks at every picture as equal and and stacks them all together. A kappa sigma clipping is it it does a distribution and it uh, looks at things that are outliers and it would throw outliers out. And you really want this on, especially if you are imaging from a city, because you're going to get a lot of satellite trails, a lot of plane trails, different things in your pictures. If you just do a straight average, those will those will show up in the final stack faintly. If you do kappa sigma clipping, those will disappear because it will throw out those pixel values as outliers. Um, okay, hope that makes sense. For result, we just want the standard mode. That's what you want when you're stacking a bunch of pictures together into one master uh, exposure. Um, mosaic and intersection mode are if you are trying to make a mosaic of the sky. So basically you're, you're moving your camera all over the sky and trying to make one uh, bigger field of view. That's not what we're doing, so we're gonna leave it on standard mode. Um, you can only, these drizzle options are very interesting and they uh, do seem uh, 
in, uh, you know, uh, like we would want this because the galaxy is going to be very small on our sensor. But unfortunately, because we didn't have a mount that uh, we didn't do auto guiding with dithering, uh, we can't use drizzle. Um, that really only applies if you are dithering, meaning moving the the field a little bit between every frame. Otherwise, drizzle doesn't work. Okay, uh, I'll click OK. Everything is fine here, so I'm going to click OK again. It gives me a final uh, check here. This is just a screen that explains everything. It does uh, explain down here that this process will temporarily use 53.9 gigabytes of on the D drive. So that's what I was concerned about with, with having that temp folder on the C drive, because I'm not sure if I even have 53 gigabytes available. Um, and if, if you don't have that amount available, then the process will fail. Um, it tells me that my total exposure in terms of lights um, is three hours, 15 minutes. So it, with 391 uh, light frames at 30 seconds each, that's our total exposure time. And that's it. Uh, we can go ahead and click OK. It now starts off the process, and um, I will mention here that right now you can see the first thing it does is it says adding offset frame. What that means in Deep Sky Stacker speak is uh, it's putting all of the bias frames together into a master bias. Um, and I'll mention here that right down here it says estimated time, remaining time, one minute, 52 seconds. That is not the total remaining time. That is just the total remaining time in this step, which is just the first step in many steps it has to do um, to make our final picture. Um, because it has to first add together all of the calibration frames to make master calibration frames. It then uses those master calibration frames to calibrate the lights. It then registers all of the lights, and then finally it stacks all the lights. And some of these steps will take a lot longer than others, but I expect this whole process to take hours, uh, considering we're stacking 391 lights. So I'm just gonna leave this. What I would suggest is make sure you're plugged into AC power, and just leave it overnight, or if you're going to work, you know, leave it going during the workday, and then you can pick it up in the evening. Um, I'm going to stop the video here and pick it back up when this is all done. Okay, it's now finished stacking, and we do get a little preview here, and there is the ability to alter that preview and even save these changes that you make um, in Deep Sky Stacker. I don't recommend actually using these histogram sliders or these different tabs here um, because it's pretty coarse um, and a little bit hard to use these adjustments and you're going to get much better results in GIMP or Photoshop or any other uh, program that's better for the post-processing. Uh, what we can see here though, I'm just going to use two fingers on my trackpad, there we go, um, or if you have a mouse with a wheel, a scroll wheel, you can use that. Um, that we do see the galaxy now. So remember in our individual lights, we couldn't really see it. Now we can see the spiral arms right there, um, but we're gonna bring it out a lot more when we do post-processing. Um, the one other thing I wanna note here before we move on to saving is if we look at this, this is um, the linear response of the channels. And for some reason, the blue channel looks almost stretched already. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Um, it's not, uh, it's probably has something to do with my light pollution here, um, but it's something to um, be aware of. This is a very linear response when the, when the spike is like very up and down like that. And this is a more non-linear response when it's, uh, when it's stretched out like that. Um, so I'm not sure why that happened, but it's something that may impact our processing in Photoshop. So for instance, I might immediately stretch the green and the red to more match the blue before doing more stretching. Um, hope that makes sense. You will see, if it doesn't make sense, you'll see in uh, the post-processing what I'm talking about. Okay, the only thing we have to do now is save. Um, it does create an autosave uh, that is a 32-bit file. Since in previous videos I've uploaded, that 32-bit file has been causing some issues for people. Um, it's really no big deal. Let's just, I'll show you how to save a 16-bit file that's in this raw uh, state. Um, and 
it's really easy. You just go over here to the processing window. You just go over here on the left-hand side to where it says processing. There's a little blue box. And the final option is save picture to file. Go ahead and click on that. And the default option is TIFF image 16 bits. So that's exactly what we want. Uh, don't choose any other option here um, unless you, you know, were going into some other uh, advanced astro imaging program, then you might choose one of these like fits options. Um, or if you know that you can work with 13 bits and you and you want to start in 13 bits and 32 bits. Ugh. Okay, the default option here is TIFF image 16 bits per channel, which is exactly what we want. It also should be the default option that down here, it says embed adjustments in the saved image, but do not apply them. And you want to leave that checked. Um, we don't want this apply adjustments to the saved image because then anything that we did down here for preview purposes would actually get um, applied to the image permanently and you can't reverse it. Um, what we want to do is just get this image in its rawest state um, and bring that into our next program. For compression, I'm just going to leave it on none. I'm going to go ahead and call this uh, m101-dss and I'll save it to the desktop, that's fine. Okay, it's done saving, and just to check here, I can double click it, and when it pulls up in the uh, default photos viewer, it should look mostly black. That is what we wanna see. Um, if you see a very bright image here, um, something may have gone wrong with your processing. I've now uh, moved over to my Mac uh, and opened up Adobe Photoshop CS6. If you have a different version of Photoshop, no problem. Everything that I'm gonna show should uh, be relevant to any modern version of Photoshop. If, you, uh, if your Photoshop looks very different than mine, you might just want to change it to the Essentials workspace, um, and uh, that should work just fine. The, thing, the things that we're mostly going to be using are uh, the uh, menus up here, a few of the tools over here, the layers, and uh, the adjustments. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to do is go up to the File menu and choose Open. And I'm going to open up that uh, m101-dss.tiff. That's the final uh, result from Deep Sky Stacker that we saved as a 16-bit TIFF file. I'll click Open. It opens like that, fairly dark. First thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to double check that it's in the right mode. So I'm going to go up to the Image menu and choose Mode. And just this looks right, RGB color and 16 bits per channel. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to duplicate this layer. Um, so we can do that by uh, going to layer, duplicate layer, or you can use the shortcut Command J if you're on a Mac or Control J on Windows. And I'll just call this duplicated layer uh, first stretch. And then as the name of this new layer suggests, what we're gonna do is we're gonna stretch the image. And that means um, make it brighter, of course, but also um, uh, go from a fairly linear response and, and, and stretch it out to a non-linear response. And, and normally if you just uh, shoot in RAW and then open a file in Adobe Camera RAW, it applies this curve automatically that, that does this for you, but we're doing it more manually. And while we're doing this, it can be helpful to have the histogram display open. Uh, if you uh, don't have uh, the histogram button, um, what you can do is just go to window and make sure that it is checked right here. Um, and then it should be available over here on the uh, right hand side of the screen. And if yours doesn't look like mine, this is the fully expanded view. Just click on this little hamburger menu in the upper right and make sure that you are, no, it's not the expanded view, sorry, it's the all channels view. That's the one I find most helpful. Um, 
because it shows up here the blue, green, and red channels in one plot, and then down here it shows them in separate plots. And that's very helpful because I can see that the red is, is out here, the green is here, and the blue is here. And just like we saw in Deep Sky Stacker, for some reason, the red and green channels look fairly linear. We have this very up and down, uh, all the information is compacted into this one little spike. Um, for some reason, the blue channel is a lot more spread out and uh, also farther over to the left, almost clipped. Um, so we're going to have to do some work here when we stretch, and we're, we want to be looking at these histograms as we're doing it. Okay, now we're ready to move on to the stretching. So make sure that you have first stretch selected over here in the layers panel on the right. Go up to the image menu and down to adjustments and then levels. And we're gonna keep coming back to levels over and over again. So I would recommend looking at what the keyboard shortcut is here and using that. So I'm on a Mac, so it's gonna be Command L for levels. If you're on a Windows, it will probably be Control L. Uh, I'll pull that up. You can see it gives us this uh, version of this histogram, but just in black and white. So now we know that this is blue, green, and red, the three spikes. And the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to level those out a little bit. So um, instead of them being so separated, I'm going to try to uh, fix the, the, the separation um, and align them a little bit. Um, and the way we're gonna do that is open up this channels uh, drop down right here in the levels command and start with red. And I'm going to stretch out the red channel a little bit, just like that. So what I've done here is I've moved this middle slider over and the left slider over. So the left slider indicates the shadow area. And so we can see we were well off the, the zero point here. So I can, I can get away with moving that a little bit to the right. And then the mid-tone slider, this is the main way, way we're stretching. We're moving that into the left. And you can see what that does is it pushes the whole red uh, peak over a little bit, but it's also stretching it out. Um, I'm gonna do the same thing with the green. And I'm just going to try to, with this mid-tone slider, line them up like that. Okay, and I'm gonna keep doing that, stretching these out a little bit. I'm gonna ignore the blue for now. So I'm gonna go back into the levels command, command L for Mac or control L on Windows. And I'm gonna do the same thing again. I'm gonna stretch out the red just by moving these two little arrows in on the peak and same thing with the green. And I mean, I have to be a little bit more aggressive with the green, it seems, to get it lined up like that. Um, I'm mostly, at this point, just looking at up here into the histogram window. But it can also be interesting, as you're doing this, to zoom in and look at the galaxy a little bit. And you can see that it is, the spiral arms are coming out a little bit. Don't worry too much about all this green noise right now um, while you're stretching. Okay, um, so now the red one is looking a little bit fatter than the green one. Um, so maybe I'll try to fix that a little bit. by Ooh, that looks a little too fat. Uh, da, 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 sorry. Still a little too fat. Something like that. Yeah, I'm going to have to do it again. Okay. Sorry, this can be time consuming. Again, you just press Command L on Mac or Control L on Windows to bring up that levels command again and again.
Okay, now they, these are fairly uniform. Um, now let's bring the blue channel up. So I'll move to blue, I'll push it over. Wow, it's quite fat. Uh, so let's see what we can do here. Now you don't, uh, you don't want to clip this blue channel too much. We're just trying to bring it out from that uh, left edge. Okay, so I can see that I now have it out of the left edge because I have a little bit of separation over there. And the issue now is this blue channel is so fat that we're going to have to stretch out our red and green some more to get them equal with that blue channel. Okay, so I've stretched out the red quite a bit just now, but then I'm going to have to move it back over to the left. Something like that. Okay, now I'm going to have to work on the green channel. Okay, so at this point I'm going to zoom out a bit. And we have some very nasty gradients going on here. Um, <clears throat> and that is influencing what we're seeing up here in the histogram display. So this bright green thing up here is a lot coming from uh, the stuff over here. Um, and so, and then the blue, of course, uh, this part here is from the background uh, there. Um, at this point though, we don't want to let the image itself be too much of a guide for how we should uh, alter these at this point. All I'm really trying to do is stretch them out, get them fairly lined up and off that left hand side. Um, so I'm just gonna do one more thing here with the blue channel. I'm gonna try to just lift it up a little bit to get a little bit more separation there. Okay, and then um, at this point, since I can clearly see, here's the galaxy with its spiral arms. Um, I'm going to crop at this point. Um, so I'm gonna open up the crop tool and roughly center the galaxy and get rid of some of this stuff along the edge. Mostly go for a blue background here, but it's okay to include a little bit of that nasty gradient on the left side. Okay, and by cropping, you can see our histogram things uh, moved again. Um, now the blue is out here and the red looks a little bit anemic. Um, let's just stretch the red just a tiny bit here just to get it starting at about the same spot as the green and the blue. Okay, that changed the gradient a little bit. Uh, of course, it also made that peak quite a bit fatter. It's now matching the blue pretty well, but now the green is looking a little bit too narrow. So one more thing here with the green. Let's go ahead and stretch that one out too. Okay, um, now let's get rid of this funky rainbow sky background that we've developed um, <clears throat> through uh, a light pollution subtraction step. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to first select all. So this will just select the entire image we're working with. You can go up to the select menu and choose the first option all or press command A on Mac, control A on Windows to select all. 
Then we're going to copy. This is under the edit menu. So edit, copy, command C on Mac, control C on Windows. Then I'm gonna press, uh, go to file new to make a new document. Um, and it uses the pixel information, the size um, and uh, bit depth that we just um, copied to the clipboard. So we don't have to change anything here because if you first copy and then do file new, it will remember all those settings. I'm just gonna call this BG for background and say okay. And then I'll paste it in with edit paste or command V, control V on Windows. I'll go ahead and delete the background layer. We don't need it. And the, what I'm gonna do here is I'm basically going to smooth this out so that all we have left is this colored background and none of the detail of the stars and the galaxy. And I'm gonna do, you, use uh, a filter for this. So if you go up to the filter menu and go down to noise and choose dust and scratches. Okay. At, uh, anywhere from about 100 pixel radius to 158, we get fairly the same amount of uh, blurring, but there is still um, a little bit of strangeness around the galaxy there. Um, so where it's a little bit, you can still see that it's a little bit brighter, but we can fix that after the fact. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and apply this at about 128. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, use the clone stamp tool here to just um, fix that up a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to turn down the opacity of the clone stamp a bit. I'm going to do 58%. I'm going to uh, hold down Option, or it would be Alt on Windows, to sample up here, and then bring that down and just click a few times to even out that gradient right there. So it was a little bit too bright on the galaxy, and I just evened it out a little bit. Um, so now we have a smoother uh, finish here. Um, speaking of smoothness, uh, if, if your gradient doesn't look very smooth, another thing you can do is blur it out a little bit with a uh, Gaussian blur. Uh, something like just some, uh, you know, a huge pixel radius is fine here. We want to make this basically this model um, as smooth as possible uh, for a proper subtraction. Okay, so now if I look at the background model we've created, then I look back here, it's looking quite good. We've taken out all the stars and galaxy. There's no obvious hot spots. Um, if you're wondering about this feature right here, um, that is a dust moat that somehow didn't get subtracted by the flats that then because of drift in the image uh, turned into a line. We're gonna deal with that towards the end of the process. So don't worry about that yet. Um, okay, next thing we have to do is we have to save this background layer. This is very important. It's very easy to forget. You want to save this as a Photoshop file. So just go to File, Save As, and save it as bg.psd for background. Okay, now go back to your M101 image, and I'm going to duplicate again. I'm going to just... Uh, press Command J or Control J on Windows. You can also get to it by layer, duplicate layer. And I'm gonna call this BG-removal. And the way that we're gonna remove the background here is we're gonna go up to the image menu and choose apply image from the image menu. Okay, the first thing it tries to do is it tries to subtract the image from itself, or actually multiply the image by itself. And that's because in the source command, it always will pick its, itself first. But we want to change that to the background that we just created. And we want to go down here to the blending mode and change it from multiply to subtract. Okay, and 
then um, I've already set the scale to one offset to 60. That's from previous, uh, you know, attempts at this or, or times I've been working with Photoshop on something similar. Um, but you may have to play around with these a little bit. Usually a scale of one works fine. Um, if it wasn't set to one, go ahead and set it to one. Um, I think it can go from one to two. Um, can it go down to zero? No, it has to be between one and two. So let's see if what it does at 1.5. You know, I don't, I don't think you'd ever want it on anything other than one. Because uh, I think anything, if you scale uh, the subtraction, I think it's always going to d apply too much blur. But we, what we do want to change is the offset. Um, the offset is basically how much, uh, how many pixel values it's going to add above a baseline when it does the subtraction. And so if you set this to zero, you can see it's subtracting way too much and clipping, uh, you know, 90% of the information to black. If you set it to 200, then the picture is way too white. So you're basically finding a, a balance here. And usually that balance is somewhere between um, 30 and 100. Um, but what I would suggest is at this point, make the picture a little bit grayer than you want it to be. Um, so even if you think at this point it looks a lot better set to 20, I would recommend you know at least doubling or even tripling that um, at this point um, because this sort of more gray look, even though it looks a lot worse, um, this is just an intermediary step and we're gonna do a lot more with the picture. So what we don't want is set the offset to low and then you, you lose detail. Um, that is not recoverable. So here's what I mean. See at offset 15, look at the this outer galaxy arm. And now let me bring that up to 60. And you can see that it's, I mean, there's a lot of noise there. Let me, let me try it down here. Okay, look at this. Look at these uh, galaxy arms. These are, you know, arms of the spiral galaxy made up of stars. And, you know, there's noise in this image, but you can see the galaxy arms up here quite clearly. Down here, they're sort of fading into the black. Now let me bring the offset up to 60, and you can see them a lot clearer. Um, even though there is a lot of noise in the image still, we can see that there is some detail in here that we want to bring out. Okay, so 60 offset looks good to me, but again, just play around with this until you get a fairly nice... Uh, gray image where all the detail is preserved and you're not losing anything. Actually, let me just go back and forth between 60 and 80 here. 70. Actually, I'm going to go with 70. Uh, this is a little bit brighter, uh, but I think that looks a little bit better um, in terms of preserving details that we might want later. Okay. Uh, so enough said about that, let's go ahead and click OK. Here's what the image looks like now. Um, it's fun once you have stretched your image like this and subtracted the background, uh, light pollution background um, to see all the little cool details that have come out. This you know, might look just like a stretched star, but I am almost positive that that is actually a background galaxy. It's an edge on, you can see. Um, there's also a sort of a regular galaxy up here. Um, and sometimes it can be challenging to know what is uh, a defect, you know, what's a, a dust mode or something like that, and what is actually uh, a whole other galaxy. It's just a, a fun part of deep sky imaging is that you have to get a little experience to recognize what is defective in your image and what is, uh, what is actually something cool that you've captured. Um, so because we captured this from a very light polluted area, um, there's a lot of noise still left in the image. We're going to try to deal with that. Um, a lot of color noise, uh, but also just random noise. And the, the galaxy itself, uh, when you zoom in on it, it doesn't have a huge amount of detail, but enough detail that when you zoom out, I think it looks pretty cool. You can at least see the nice spiral pattern. 
Okay, um, so next step. Let's look at the histogram again. Okay, um, after the background removal step, um, they're fairly lined up, which is good, but the blue channel is a little bit skinnier than the green and red. So let's this might not hold, but let's um, go ahead, and duplicate this again, and call this second stretch, just to see if we can bring out the blue a little bit without messing up the image too much. So I'm going to open up the blue channel. I'm going to open up my histogram view here. And I'm just going to stretch it a little bit. All right, let's try that. Let's try just a little bit more, sorry. A lot of times I just find it's easier to iterate rather than try to get it perfect in one go. Okay, I think we're we're, we're getting at more natural color here. Um, with these all lined up and fairly uniform now, um, let's reset the black point a little bit just by opening up levels one more time. This time we can leave it on channel RGB rather than looking at the individual channels. And I'm just going to bring the levels down like that a little bit. Um, so bringing the shadow slider up so that it's not clipping anything, but just um, like that. The next thing I need to handle um, all of the color noise in the background is a luminance mask. Um, and we're going to we're going to apply that luminance mask to the background only so we can uh, desaturate it and possibly uh, blur it a little bit. Um, and so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to duplicate the layer again. If you don't know the shortcut by now, it's Command J, or you can always go up to Layer, Duplicate Layer, and I'll call this uh, Loom Luminance Mask. Um, and to make it a luminance mask, I'm going to go to Image, Adjustments, and apply a black and white adjustment to it, like that. And so you can see it took out all the color, makes the picture look quite a bit better already, uh, because most of what we have is color noise. Um, and then I'm going to uh, open up a curves adjustment on this. Command M, Control M on Windows, if you want the shortcut. And I'm going to do a fairly aggressive S curve. And I'll probably do that a couple times, actually. Curves. Okay, and so basically what I'm trying to do with this is um, make a fairly black and white mask. So um, the background should be fairly uniformly black. While the yeah, actually, that looks better. Well, the galaxy and the um, stars are all white. So here's the original image. 
and there's our luminance mask. Okay, now I'm going to uh, open up a hue slash saturation adjustment layer. So to do this, if you look, here's the layers command over on the right, I mean the layers panel, sorry, over on the right, and here's the adjustments panel right above it. To open up a hue slash saturation adjustment, just click this button right here, and it opens it up. Um, and you can see that uh, automatically it has a, a layer mask um, applied to it, but that layer mask being all white means that it's going to apply to everything. And what we want to do is we want to use our luminance mask to have it only apply to the parts we want it to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this with um, select all. I'm going to copy it with edit copy, command C. And I'm going to uh, hold down option on a Mac or alt on Windows and click on that um, mask thumbnail on the hue slash saturation layer. And then I'm going to paste it into there. And so now you can see uh, that's pasted on. I'll click back out, um, but it's there. And I can actually now uh, hide this layer. We might need it later, so I'm just going to leave it. I'm not going to delete it, but um, I'm just going to uh, turn off its visibility by just clicking the little eyeball right here. Okay, and nothing has happened to our image yet. I know that was a lot of steps uh, to get no uh, visible progress yet, but we're about to make a bunch of dramatic changes using that mask that we just made. So let me go ahead and deselect. Um, and right now, uh, white selects. Um, so basically, uh, if you remember that about mask that white selects, if we anything that we do on this huge slice saturation layer is going to apply to the parts of the image that are white and not apply to the parts of the image that are black. So uh, to show you what that means, if I uh, open up the adjustments here and apply saturation and lightness, you can see that lightness is applying to the stars and the galaxy, but not to the background, right? Okay, so that is fine to do. I'm going to go ahead and, whoop, too much. I'm going to boost the saturation of those a little bit. And you can see the stars got uh, a little bit uh, bluer and things like that. Um, but what we really want to do with this uh, for everything to stand out is to desaturate the background a little bit. So let me go ahead and duplicate this layer this hue slash saturation adjustment layer. Layer, duplicate layer. And I'll call this one desaturate BG. Um, that's not what it did at first. It just made everything super saturated. Um, but let's go ahead and invert the layer mask. So I'll just pull it up so you know what I mean. Um, so here it is. To invert it, I can just press Command-I on Mac or Control-I on Windows, and it inverts the colors. If we exit back out of that, you can see that made um, the, the colors of the background uh, quite distinctive. And one thing to note here is that in addition just to the random color noise, we do have a little bit of a blue problem right around the galaxy. So we might have to deal with that later or maybe not. We'll see. Um, so this is sort of crazy, right? Because we wanted this to desaturate and because we duplicated, it's now saturating. So let's go ahead and bring this down and bring uh, lightness down as well. Okay. So we're getting somewhere, right? Um, there's a little bit of a green bias to the picture. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Um, so at this point, I'm going to uh, apply a curves adjustment layer just to everything. And I'm going to just play around with this green a little bit. And for some reason, 
the galaxy is looking pretty good. Um, for some reason, that green cast is mostly in that corner. So I'm tempted just to crop again, because um, I don't think that that corner is adding much anyways. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to crop in a little bit. OK, um, we are getting somewhere. Let's go ahead and try just duplicating both the desaturate and the saturate layers just to make the image a little bit more punchy. So there's more saturation. There's more desaturation. We still have a bit of a color balance issue here. So let's go a little bit more extreme and open up color balance. Um, this is a color balance adjustment layer and I'm just going to uh, play around with these a little bit. We're getting somewhere. Um, I, I do like the color of the galaxy. The, this galaxy should have a sort of um, warmish yellow center with more blue, uh, bluish white spiral arms. So that's actually looking pretty good. Um, but the, the star color is uh, not that great. I think we're still just to a little green on the stars. Let me open this curves back up, see if we can, ah, bring that green down even a little bit more. Okay, um, I'm going to now go ahead and do some final little adjustments here. Um, I want to use my mask again. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and open up another curves adjustment, but I'm going to uh, option drag my mask onto it and say, yes, replace the layer mask. Open this up. And basically what I'm doing here is I'm looking at the galaxy and I'm just going to drag this up a little bit until I think that looks about the right brightness. So here's with it off, here's with it on, just to make that stand out a little bit more. And I'm going to do the same thing with the background. It's a little bit too bright right now. If you're a numbers person, what you can do is open up info and then click on down here to the second stretch. And if you move your mouse over the background, um, right now we're peaking on at around high 30s to 40s. And I'm comfortable with bringing that down into the 20s. So let's open up another curves layer. This time we're going to option drag or alt drag the layer mask from one of these desaturate adjustment layers to replace it. And I'm just going to reset this black point just a little bit. Okay, that's before, after, and when I'm doing that before, after, I'm actually noticing that I think the background is a little bit too red. So I'm also going to go ahead and open up a selective color adjustment here and drag that on again. And go into the blacks and take out Let's say minus three on the magenta, minus one on the yellow. And let's do plus two on the black. Okay. Um, it's, it's close. The, the, the one thing I'm not liking is that the, the the stars over here look too blue. I'm not sure how that happened. Probably something in the gradient removal step went wrong. Um, but let's try to fix it uh, in a hackish way. Um, so what I'm gonna do is 
I'm just going to make a new color balance layer. And I only want it to apply to this side of the picture. So I'm going to draw a gradient on the mask. Uh, the default gradient is black to white. So if we just do something like that, whoop, wrong mode. Uh, if we just do something like that, and then look at it, you can see it's only gonna apply to that side of the picture where we have the stars that are too blue. And then I'll open this up. Try to fix those stars a little bit. Now, of course, this created a new problem because the background looks crazy now. Um, but let's go ahead and uh, fix that by just making a new selective color layer, dragging that onto there, go into our blacks and remove and just play around with these uh, four sliders until it matches the rest of the image a little better. We're close. I still just, this very edge now, just this big bright star up there and the, the fact that this is now a little bit darker than the rest of the image is bothering me. So in the matter of time, uh, normally I might try to fix that, but in the interest of time, let's just crop it. Okay, I like it. So we're getting close. We got a couple nice bright blue stars down here, but we have some star color. Uh, the galaxy is looking really nice. Um, last thing, just some final touch-ups here. Um, we still haven't dealt with our dark streak right there. Um, I think that's it. Maybe that's it for final touch-ups. Um, so to deal with that, what I'm gonna do is I want basically what we're seeing as its own layer. And this is a weird command in Photoshop. Um, I don't actually know where it is in the menus. Someone asked me to show everything in the menus as I'm going. I'm sorry, I don't know where this is in the menus, but the keyboard shortcut is Command Option Shift E, or that would be Control Alt Shift E on Windows. So Command Option Shift E on Mac, Control Alt Shift E on Windows. And what it does is it takes everything that you're seeing, just the visible, and merges it and makes it its own layer on top. Uh, that's very helpful. So I'm gonna call this touch ups. And what I wanna do is basically select that, um, that part up there that's this dark line um, and brighten it a little bit. So I'm gonna uh, create a new curves layer. And with the layer mask on the curves layer selected, I'm going to grab my brush tool. And I want a 0% hardness brush or the softest brush available. And then I'm going to make my brush size just a tiny bit bigger than the line itself. And I'm going to go ahead and and let's do, I don't know, 75% about opacity. And then I'm just going to draw in that line right there. I'll show you what it looks like. Okay, so pretty close to uh, where the line is. Um, let's see now if we can fix this up with curves and we might have to touch up the mask a little bit after. So I'm going to just pull. Oh, sorry, we have to invert it because uh, right now it's doing everything to everything else. Uh, but we want to actually just have it apply to that line. 
So I'm going to invert the mask. Now it looks like that. And now we can apply our curves adjustment. And that's it. Uh, maybe, just a, nope, too much down there. Okay, I think we did it in one. Yeah, that's not noticeable anymore. Um, so all I did was drew out where it was on using a mask and then applied a very small curves adjustment to even out that spot. Okay, I think we're done. Um, it's looking really nice. I like the spiral arms of the galaxy. The star color is okay, considering how much light pollution we had. And uh, we still have a fairly nice wide field of view. I know we've done a lot of cropping to fix problems, but that's how it goes sometimes. Uh, let's go ahead and show saving. So if I do file save, uh, the default option is going to be TIFF because that's what we brought it in as. TIFF is a good option if you're planning to bring this into any other program or for long-term archival storage. I'll go ahead and cancel though. Let's do save as and save it as a Photoshop file. And I know I should have been saving as a Photoshop file as we went, but I forgot, got too excited. So anyways, let's save as a Photoshop file. I'll go ahead and embed the color profile. Um, that's fine, call it PSD, okay. And then I like the save for web option for saving off JPEG or PNGs. Um, in Photoshop CS6, it's still a main option under the file menu. I think in newer versions, they might have moved it to export or somewhere else, um, but look around for it in the file menu because it's really nice. What you can do with the save for web option is change the size of the picture. I'm not gonna use that feature, but if you wanted to, you could change it right here. Um, you can make sure that it's converting to sRGB, which is what you want for saving to the web. And you can you have all the different web-friendly options up here, PNG, JPEG, GIF. Um, I'm just going to save it off as a 100% quality JPEG, at, and that makes it about 2.1 megabytes. I'll just save it to the desktop here. Okay, if we hide Photoshop, open it up in preview, make it full screen. Okay, and there's our final image of M101, the pinwheel galaxy. And yes, there is still some noise uh, in the image, um, and definitely noise in the galaxy itself, but all in all, not too bad a job uh, considering the conditions. Uh, this was about three hours from a Bortle 9 zone with a 60 millimeter refractor. Um, and I actually think it's a pretty nice image. We do have some interesting uh, variety of star color. I don't know how accurate these star colors are. Uh, Photoshop doesn't have any kind of photometric calibration in it, but it's still, uh, I'm still, I still really like this image. Um, and I hope that you've learned something about uh, processing through this. I know there were, there were probably more steps uh, in Photoshop than in previous tutorials, but uh, we had to do a little bit more heavy lifting to deal with the light pollution here. Um, but hopefully this may be useful because I know a lot of people live in cities and, and still want to do astrophotography. This has been Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com um, and I hope that uh, you subscribe. Uh, if you stick around a little bit, you'll see all of my patrons on Patreon. Uh, I always put um, everyone in the credits. So if you're interested in joining me on Patreon, um, the link is in the description. Till next time, clear skies.